Hello again, everyone, and welcome to this edition of Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. We come today to 1 Kings. We're in 1 Kings, and uh, <clears throat> we resume our study in 1 Kings chapter 7. And um, we begin in verse number 1. 1 Kings chapter 7. Actually, 1 Kings chapter 6, I'm sorry. 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1. So get your Bible, open it up, and we will begin in just one minute. The Scripture Verse by Verse website is found at thebibleversebyverse.com. And that website is significant and it is important. And that's because it's all about the Word of God, which is the most important thing on the earth, by far. It's the most valuable thing that you could possibly own is a holy Bible. And God the Holy Spirit will never steer you wrong when you read the Word. But we all need teachers. I need teachers. You need teachers. And God has raised teachers up. And I'm one of them. I'm totally committed to the Word of God. I'm totally committed to getting it out clearly and concisely and not watering it down for any reason at all. And that's how I have been for over 30 years. And so I have three complete series of going through the Bible archived for you at thebibleversebyverse.com. I've saved all my work because it's that important to me. I don't save things. You know that? I don't. I don't save. Th I save. I've got a T-square hanging in my wall, on my wall, that belonged to my dad. I remember being in his workshop when I was a little boy, and he always had that T-square hanging on the wall. And uh, my mom and dad didn't have anything. They never owned their own house or anything like that. But when, when my dad, when he was dying, he said, go out in the garage, take whatever you want. He had some expensive tools. He had this and that, all sorts of stuff. I took the, the T-square. That's what I took because that's what, it had sentimental value to me. And so I don't, I don't care about the things of this world. I don't care what men may do to me. I don't care, frankly, if people like my teaching or dislike my teaching. I'm interested in having Jesus be pleased with what I say. So I give out the Word of God straight, and I've been doing it for over 30 years. And you can study the Word of God in its entirety at your pace and your convenience at the thebibleversebyverse.com. I spent a little more time than I normally do, but I guess I, I needed to say those things for your benefit, maybe. Anyway, 1 Kings chapter 6. Father, sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Chapter 6, verse 1. And it came to pass in the 480th year after the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel in the month Ziv, which is the second month, that he began to build the house of the Lord. So 480 years after Israel entered their promised land, 3,000 years after Adam's creation, in May of 925 BC, Israel started to build the temple. Verse 2, and the house which King Solomon built for the Lord, the length of it was threescore cubits, and the breadth of it twenty cubits, and the height of it thirty cubits. So it was ninety feet by thirty feet and four and a half stories high. Now I'm going to skip all the way down to verse 12 because I'm not going to give you the dimensions of every little thing in the temple, okay? And you'll thank me for that later. You go ahead and read it if you want to. I've read it, but I'm not going to spend time teaching it. Verse 11. And the word of the Lord came to Solomon, saying, Concerning this house which thou art building, if thou wilt walk in my statutes and execute mine ordinances and keep all my commandments to walk in them, then will I perform my word with thee, which I spoke unto David thy father. So, in other words, if Israel keeps God's law, including the moral law and the religious ceremonies and the judicial laws, 
then God will make sure that Israel has good times. And it's not that complicated. And the same principle carries over to us today. You obey God, God will bless you. Yes, we're saved by faith. We're saved by grace, apart from works. We're saved when we repent and receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But after you're saved, God does not bless rebellion. He blesses faithfulness and holiness. So if you want to enjoy your salvation the best possible, then walk with the Lord. And that's the principle that carries over throughout all the ages. Verse 13. And I will dwell among the children of Israel and will not forsake my people Israel. Well, you know, the problem is Israelites turn their back on God, as we will see. And as a result, God did forsake his people. His visible presence was seen leaving the temple in the book of Ezekiel. We'll see that when we get there. Now, I'm not going to read verses 14 through 38, but um, actually, let's just go down and read verse 38 to close up this chapter because there are just more dimensions of the temple and stuff. Let's read 37. And in the fourth year was the foundation of the house of the Lord laid in the month Ziv. And in the eleventh year, in the, in the month Bull, which is the eighth month, was the house finished throughout all the parts of it, and according to all the fashion of it. So was he seven years in building it. So the eighth month would correspond to our November. It took seven years and six months for Solomon and company to build the holy temple of God. Seven years and six months. Chapter 7, but Solomon was building his own house 13 years, and he finished all his house. I've, I've heard preachers. You know, I mean, I'm a straight shooter. I know I am. And, uh, and modern evangelicals, a lot of them don't like me because I call sin sin, and I point out evil, and I point out false doctrine when it's blatantly opposed to Orthodox Christian uh, teaching. I point it out because that's my job. So I, I don't have any problem being negative when you need to be negative. But I swear some preachers look for things and make things up that they can, negative stuff. I mean, there's enough bad stuff that we all do. There's enough bad stuff in the world that can last you a lifetime to talk about. You don't have to make stuff up. And I think people, I've heard people, preachers, I think, make stuff up about Solomon. Like right here, well, Solomon spent 13 years building his house and only seven years building the house of the Lord. So that proved that, that his house was more important to him than God. And they started ripping Solomon. Well, I would rip Solomon at this point. The guy was living for the Lord, and the Lord was blessing him. Besides, I just wonder, you know, he built God's house faster, okay? He didn't skimp on God's house. I mean, that was a beautiful thing. We saw some of the the material that was used and all the time that went into getting the foundational stones made of marble and, and all the fa fancy cedar logs coming from Lebanon. I mean, he didn't skimp on that thing. But, but he did build God's house faster, twice as fast. And, and that's because I think at this point God was more important to him than he was to himself. So with that, we will skip down all the way down to chapter 8, verse 1, because I'm not going to look at the materials and the dimensions and all these other things in the temple. So let's go to chapter 8, verse 1. Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes of the leaders of the fathers of the children of Israel before King Solomon in Jerusalem, that they might bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. So the, the temple is done, and it's time for God to move in, as it were, in the presence of his ark. And the ark here is called the covenant. It's called the ark of the covenant, and that's because the two stones containing the Ten Commandments were in that ark. And that ark represented God's throne room on earth, as we will see. Verse 2. And all the men of Israel assembled themselves before King Solomon at the feast in the month of 
Ithim, which is the seventh month. The seventh month for Israel would be our October. Verse 3. And all the elders of Israel came, and the priests took up the ark. Now, the priests took up the ark. The priests carried the ark, but even they couldn't touch it. Remember what happened last time somebody touched the ark? Uzzah? God struck him dead on the spot because he touched it. This thing is holy because it's God's throne. You don't go up to a king and touch his throne. Not if you still want your head to be attached to your body. And God is infinitely holy, and you can't, and back in, you can't even do it today. Yes, our sins have been paid for through Jesus Christ, but you better not become familiar with God and treat him like he's one of the boys or like I can't stand him being referred to as the big guy upstairs. And maybe people don't mean anything by it, but that's disrespectful. He is holy God Almighty. And anyway, you can't touch that ark. So even, even the priests had to carry it with poles. Verse 4. And they brought up the ark of the Lord and the tabernacle of the congregation and all the holy vessels that were in the tabernacle, even those did the priests and the Levites bring up. And God designated the tribe of Levi to care for the ark and the tabernacle and to move it if it needed to be moved. And each and every item each and every piece of furniture, each and every candlestick, whatever it might have been, table, I mean, you name it, each and every item inside of that holy tabernacle was moved by the specific people in the tribe of Levi who God designated to move those particular pieces. I mean, this thing had to be done according to specs. And you better follow God's law, and you better follow God's word precisely. Every word of God is specifically in there for a reason. And that's why the modern translations that play fast and loose, leaving in some cases thousands of words out of the Bible, well, it just doesn't flow. I don't care if it flows or not. It's supposed to be in the Bible. God warns, don't take anything out of my word. Don't add anything to my word. It's good enough the way it is. And that's what I love about the King James Version because it is built on the best manuscripts, the received text that has been preserved since the days of the apostles. I don't have any doubt in my mind that this Bible that I got my fingers on right now in front of me is the Holy Word of God. Every word of it. I believe it. It's been preserved, as God said it would be, in Psalm 12, verse 6 and 7, which, by the way, has been twisted and perverted in the modern translations. Not surprisingly. But everything had to be carried by the specific people in the specific tribe in the specific manner because it was God's word that had to be followed. Everything. Even the utensils used in the tabernacle were holy and had to be handled with care. Verse 5. And King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel who were assembled before him were with him before the ark, sacrificing sheep and oxen that could not be counted nor numbered for multitude. This was a huge and holy event. And so as they're bringing all these things up, as they're filling the temple with the ark and all the other furniture that was in the tabernacle, which was, remember, the original worship place was a tent. It had to be portable for when the Israelites traveled through the wilderness on their way out of Egypt. But as they were bringing all these things into the temple, they would stop and they would sacrifice to God along the road. And these sacrifices were thank offerings. They were thanking God. They were so happy. They were thanking God, uh, no doubt, for the ark. They were thanking God for the tabernacle. They were thanking God for the temple. They were thanking God for everything. They were thanking God for his presence among them. I'm sure that was by far the most important thing. And all the wonderful things that he did for them. They thanked him so much. They stopped and they offered sacrifices. Thank offerings. They offered so many of them that they lost count of how many sacrifices they offered. They lost count. Because you know what? 
you can never thank God too much. It is impossible to thank God too much. If he never did another thing for you except saved you from hell fire, it is impossible to thank him too much. My goodness, one second in hell. If you ever got out of that place after being in there for a second, or even getting close to it, getting close to the heat and the screaming, if you even got, if you just skimmed off the top of it and you came back, you'd never forget it. And you couldn't, you'd say thank you until you were hoarse. You couldn't talk anymore. We can't thank God too much. And plus, he gives us so much more than that through Jesus Christ. He always deserves more thank yous. Be ye thankful, the Bible says. Verse 6. And the priest brought in the ark of the covenant of the Lord unto its place, un into the inner sanctuary of the house, to the most holy place, even under the wings of the cherubim. Now, there was a golden angel placed on both sides of the Ark of the Covenant. So you had the Ark, which was a box, plated with gold. The lid was solid gold. And then on both sides of the lid, you had holy angels made out of gold. Okay? And the wings of these two angels spread over the top of the Ark. And, those, and you know what? Those angels signified... The special angels that are in heaven, which guard God's throne. So, verse 8. And they drew out the staves, that the ends of the staves were seen out in the holy place before the inner sanctuary, but they were not seen outside. And they are there unto this day. The poles that were used to carry the ark were never removed from the ark itself never removed from the rings they just kept them right there verse 8 there was there was nothing in the ark except the two tables of stone which Moses put there at Horeb when the Lord made a covenant Horeb is Sinai when the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt so remember Moses went up on, on top of Mount Sinai when people stayed below and um, and and when he came down with the two tablets containing the Ten Commandments, he put them in the ark. That's why it's called, as I said earlier, the Ark of the Covenant. And he, the Bible says here that that was the only thing that was in the ark. Now, that, that's different than in previous times because the ark had earlier contained the two tablets of stone, but also Aaron's staff that had miraculously blood budded and blossomed, proving that Aaron and his descendants were the priestly line in Israel. And so that was, that was placed in the ark. And also a gold pot containing some manna. That was in the ark too. But evidently, remember what happened uh, earlier, quite a bit earlier, when the Philistines had captured the ark in battle? Evidently, they must have removed the golden pot and the staff, I imagine they thought, well, that's, that's worth something. You know, they were valuable, especially that golden pot. So they took those things out, but not surprisingly, they left the stone tablets with the Ten Commandments in the ark. They didn't bother taking them out. And you know why? It's because they didn't care about the Word of God. They cared about the gold. You know, maybe they found some value in that walking stick. I, I have no idea. They must have. But the Ten Commandments, what do we need that for? Man, we don't want that around. We don't want to, we don't want to be looking at those Ten Commandments or some people might be tempted to keep them. That's what our mighty Supreme Court ruled back in the day, a few decades ago. Well, no, we can't have... We can't have the, the picture of the Ten Commandments in the public schools because this is his reasoning. The guy who wrote the, uh, the uh, verdict, because uh, some might meditate on them and might actually keep them. Wouldn't that be a terrible thing? To have children keep the Ten Commandments like, Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill. And, you know, the, 
the Philistines had about as much disdain for the commandments of God as that Supreme Court justice who ruled and many others today. But so they left him in there. They didn't want him. No use for him. No use for the word of God. Those who love God will honor his commandments. Those who love God will honor his word and love his word, even if his word sometimes rubs them the wrong way. And those who have no regard for God or his word, they will have no guard, regard for, com for his commandments, either for his law. Who cares? Old-fashioned. Don't need it. Don't want it. Verse 10. And it came to pass, when the priest were come out of the holy place, that the cloud filled the house of the Lord. Ah, how neat is that? So they moved all the furniture in, right? And the same cloud that was with the Israelites, which was the Shekinah glory cloud, cloud, which signified the very presence of God, that same cloud that was with the Israelites and led them through the wilderness 40 years, now entered into the temple. It condensed itself, and it entered into that temple. And this was God's way of showing that they did a good job, that they did it right when they built that thing. And uh, he will meet with the Israelites in that temple for worship. Verse 11, so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. God's presence was so powerful that the priest couldn't even do their work in the temple. I mean, it was so thick. And I can imagine it wasn't just the, the thickness of the cloud that made them incapable of doing the work. It had to be the fact that God's presence, God's real presence was there. That had to be very intimidating. You know, when we know that we know that we are in God's presence during those close times of fellowship, when we know, when we know, when we know that he's in our presence, there is no standing. There is no haughtiness. There is no sinful pride. And if you do stand, your head's going to be bowed. Because when you know, when you're having close fellowship with Jesus and you can feel his presence, you're going to bow your head if you're not down on your face, just out of respect and awe for God. So they, they couldn't stay in there. Verse 12, then spoke Solomon. The Lord said that he would dwell in the thick darkness. And that was that cloud. The cloud was so heavy that it looked like darkness. And Solomon knew that God was there. What a thrill for Solomon, the leader the king of Israel, to know that he had done his job well and that God moved in and he was pleased with everything that he has done so far. What a thrill to know that God was there if you're the leader. And, and what, a, what an overwhelming thing to experience as a leader. He knew that God was pleased with him. And there is nothing that's more important than that. There's nothing that will make you feel better than knowing that God is pleased with you and that you're leading people the correct way, that you're doing the right thing, that you're saying the right thing. It's an amazing feeling. There's nothing that comes close with the joy that comes from being obedient to God, totally sold out to Jesus Christ without any unconfessed sins in your life, without any sins in your life that haven't been repented of. There is nothing that comes close to beating the joy that comes from knowing that you and Jesus are as tight as a drum. There ain't a sin in this world that can even come close to scratching the surface of the joy that that'll bring you. It's an amazing thing. And notice verse 13. Solomon says, I have surely built thee a house to dwell in, a settled place for thee to abide in forever. A settled place. This isn't a tent. This is a permanent building. And, and, and the temple was great. 
And God was pleased. And the whole thing was just really nice. And you know why God was pleased? Well, yeah, because he likes workmanship. Well, he probably does. But I think God was really pleased because this temple was an expression of his devotion. I should say of their devotion to him. They loved him. And they wanted to build him that temple. And they did it nicely. They did a nice job, a beautiful job. And I think that's what pleased God more than anything else. And so it's nice that they had the temple. But the most important thing is that God was with his people and God was pleased. That's what they wanted. And that's what God wanted. And you know, a relationship with God, that is the important thing. I'm not saying the things that we do for God, like them building a temple. I'm not saying that that's not important. The things that we do for God, the things that we give God, those are important, very important. If they are an expression of our devotion to him, then they're just really lovely things to him. Verse 14, And the king turned his face about, and blessed all the congregation of Israel. And all the congregation of Israel stood. The congregation stood out of respect for God. Boy, this was not a laid-back, casual thing at all. God was there. I get weary, to be frank with you, of seeing the casual dress and the casual attitude of people in churches today, modern evangelicalism, you know? I have a guy who, who, who I see every now and then. Um, I don't even know his name, but he knows I'm a minister, a preacher. And he'll come up to me and say, hey, have you visited this church yet in town? And no, I haven't visited that church. Oh, it's the most wonderful church I've ever been to in my life. This guy's probably about 70. It's the most wonderful church I've ever been into in my life. And last time I saw him, he was dressed. this guy was dressed with uh, an old sweatshirt and older jeans. He says, look how I'm dressed. He says, the pastor isn't dressed this good. It's just wonderful. Oh, he was just so thrilled with that. He wears torn jeans and an untucked shirt. Oh man, you know, he's got a beard and he's got long hair. And well, I got a beard and kind of long hair too. But, but this guy was just so impressed with it. Oh, and he's entertaining. He, he, he can keep you entertained for, for a whole hour with his sermon. Yeah, mm-hmm. I said, yeah. Well, you know, that's what it's all about, being entertained. Just like the guy who's running around on stage, the pastor with a big old squirt gun. Ooh, boy, and hundreds of evangelicals just laughing like crazy. That's church. That's not church. That's a circus. That's what that is. It's an embarrassment. But the people aren't embarrassed. But anyway... The congregation stood out of respect for God. I like it when in church people stand for the reading of God's word or they, or they stand when they sing worship songs to God. There, sh there should be respect for God. Church should be a holy thing. And we shouldn't go there to get. We should go there to give. I don't like it when people say, well, yeah, you should go to this church, but I get, I get a lot out of it. Or I go to this church because it's really good there. What in the world does that mean? I know what that means. It means it's entertaining. It means the pastor's funny. It means, it means he tells a lot of neat stories, it, and, and it's really good there. And the music course is great rock and roll. It's good there. Really entertaining. It's good there. You don't go there. You, don't, you shouldn't go to church to get. You should go to church, and it should be all focused on Jesus Christ, and it should all be designed to give, to give Jesus our undivided devotion and attention and to learn about him, period. That's it. That's church. That's what it's supposed to be. You don't think anybody came to the temple to get? They came to give God their humble worship. And, of course, there's a, there's a nice spiritual kickback to that. There's joy and giving God what he deserves. Oh, man, I'm out of time. We got to stop. You can pick it up. We'll pick it up right here next time. Meanwhile, you can study the whole Bible at thebibleversebyverse.com. 
And if the Word of God is a blessing to you, please remember we are brought to you by your prayers and financial support. You can give in a secure method at thebibleversebyverse.com. Just click the donate button and give as the Lord may lead. So long.